Uh, finally, iodine. Uh, iodine insufficiency um, is uh, is an issue for some children, and severe severe deficiency results in cognitive impairment. is the number one cause of preventable brain damage in the world, which is a little bit shocking, but it's true. Mild deficiency in pregnant women. Um, and infants can lower IQ by 10 to 15 points, adversely affecting learning ability. So we just really need to be aware of where our iodine is coming from and making sure there's a source. Uh, the risk is definitely higher in vegans because um, the you know, key sources in omnivorous diets are, are things like um, fish and, and, and milk and eggs and things like that. So iodine, the iodine RDA um, is uh, about um, 130 micrograms for seven to 12 month old uh, children, 12 month old children. It's about 90 for one to eight year old children and then 120 for nine to 13 and 150 as it is in adults for, for 14 plus. It's higher in pregnancy and lactation as well. Uh, the food sources, the richest sources, as I mentioned, are seaweed, dairy products, fish, seafood, eggs, and iodized salt. Um, seaweed can easily exceed the upper limit. This is an extremely concentrated food. In Japan, um, seaweed is regularly consumed as part of the traditional diet. It's not in North America. Some vegans include it, but they don't always. And so if you're, if you're not including seaweed, then the only significant source, I mean, you can get little bits from fruits and vegetables and so forth, but the, the key source then becomes iodized salt. And of course, many uh, vegans prefer not to use iodized salt. And so then it really can be an issue. So how do we boost intake? Well, if you're using salt, I would suggest we should be using iodized salt or iodized sea salt. You can get some decent salts that are iodized. If you're not, um, especially if you're not consuming seaweed. Uh, you can in include, another thing you can do is include controlled amounts of seaweed, particularly if you're not consuming seafood, dairy, and eggs, which is, of course, uh, the case for vegans. Um, and then use a supplement, um, uh, a multivitamin, or iodine drops as, a, as another option. So in summary, um, well-designed plant-based diets are safe and appropriate for growing children. And we are actually more likely to meet children's nutritional needs with a thoughtfully planned plant-based diet than we are by feeding them a typical Western diet. But the most compelling reasons for shifting to a plant-based diet are the benefits beyond personal health the benefits for future generations to all life on Earth and to our planet uh, itself. And the information that I talked about today is all provided in much greater detail in uh, the book Nourish, which was just released in November of 2020. And uh, with that, I will um, finish my presentation. And of course, I, I um, must mention my other uh, books, uh, Becoming uh, Vegan uh, and Becoming um, Raw, as well as, as guidebooks um, for families. So, stop my share. Brenda, thank you. That was truly, truly amazing. And I know I can hear a collective audience gasp saying, yes, that was worth the wait. Really tremendous. Oh, thank, thank you so you much. Again. Well, really. thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I'm sorry again for the technical difficulties and uh, rushing through a little bit. But I hope that some of the information that was provided will be of value to uh, the people that were able to join us. Well, I, I know it was. And, and with that, um, we're going to go ahead and start our, our live Q&A session with you now, if that's okay. Absolutely. And great, great. And so um, I think everybody uh, is aware, but just in case you're not, what we're going to ask everybody to do now is on your Zoom control tab at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a tab that says reactions. Uh, some people have it in their participants tab, but most people have it in their reactions tab. You can click on raise hand. And if you go ahead and click on raise hand, we will see your hand raised and we will take your questions in the order in which we receive them. Uh, as we do that, we'll go ahead and ask you to unmute each time. And so 
Um, with that, I already start to, I'm starting to see a couple of hands coming in already, which is great. And keep them coming, everybody. We'd love to have as many questions as we can take for Brenda. I know she wants to help you all out as well. So with that, I'm going to open this up to Sophia, who has waited patiently. Sophia, thank you so much. And uh, go ahead with your question for Brenda. Hi, Brenda. Thank you Hello, so much. Sophia. <laughs> thank you so much for your generous guidance. And uh, I wonder if I can ask you a question uh, that is not related only to children. Uh, sure. Well, yeah, thank you. I am vegan and I'm doing intermittent fasting to improve my poor digestion, but I keep losing weight. Is there a way to fast and keep my weight intact at the same time? Um, I would say, you know, the big thing is that, is that uh, how long are, is your intermittent fast? How long are you doing it for? And then how big is your window of time to eat during the day? And then we have to look at that window and try to figure out how to get more calories in that window. So how long are you, uh, are you fasting every day, like doing um, a time restricted feeding where you stop eating and then you start uh, again the next day at a certain time? Uh, I fast uh, nearly every day, about 16 um, hours, 14 to 16 hours uh, fasting. And it helped me a lot uh, for my stomach uh, problem, but still have poor digestion. So I'm keeping on working on it. Okay. So are, uh, um, are you eating three, three meals? Time, in, your, yes. in your window. Okay. Yeah, so most of it, time, sorry, most of time, two meals and a okay. smoothie because I cannot digest easily food. So, okay. So two meals plus a smoothie is okay. Uh, we should be able to, I mean, the, the thing is, is you, we have to figure out how to get your calories up. So in becoming vegan comprehensive edition, there's an entire chapter your, on your um, weight for underweight individuals. But what mm. I would say is, is boost the calories in your smoothie. So uh, in your smoothie, add hemp seeds, maybe a quarter cup of hemp seeds, add, uh, you know, add uh, concentrated calories, add avocado, add, you know, you make sure that you've got some fat in the form of nuts and seeds, use um, a, a good fortified non dairy milk, like a like a fortified soy milk with lots of of um, calories and so you're getting a more energy dense smoothie and then in your other meals um, uh, make sure that you have adequate fat so uh, because that's more calorically dense and you have adequate starchy foods in those meals and legumes and so um, for example if you're having um, you know a salad uh, for example as one meal you want to make sure you've got an excellent protein source, an excellent carbohydrate source. So you're adding grains, adding legumes, adding starchy vegetables, and then pour on top very generously a very fat laden dressing, which would, and it doesn't have to be with oils at all. It can be with, you know, when I make my dressings, I might put in cashews and hemp seeds and, you know, so nuts and seeds, you want to get those calories from whole foods as much as possible or avocados uh, to, to try to get as many calories in. And if you're going super low fat, it's hard to get a calorically dense meal because the foods have a greater volume for less calories. And that's wonderful for people who are trying to lose weight. But for people who are trying to gain weight or not lose any more weight, uh, they need more energy dense foods. And the most energy dense foods or calorie dense foods are nuts and seeds and avocados and these more fat rich foods. Thank you, Brenda. Um, we're going to move on now to somebody with the initials DF. DF, if you'd go ahead and unmute yourself, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brenda. You are amazing. I've been following your work for many years. Thank you. Thank you. Thank I have, you. <laughs> I have a couple of uh, questions. Um, I have been plant-based for some time, uh, but my work uh, white blood cell count is lower than the than the normal range. Uh, I think the normal range is like four and it's like three, mine is like 3.8 or 3.9. It's been like this for a couple of years, uh, but I don't, I don't think I have any clinical symptoms of not feeling well. 
Um, so I'm just wondering whether this is healthy, this is okay. My second question is, uh, when, we, when it comes to metabolic health or managing weight, do we need to differentiate between like brown adipose tissue, white adipose tissue, and visceral fat. I know visceral fat is not, it's not a good thing, but I was reading up a little bit on like brown adipose tissue and white adipose tissue. I just wonder whether you can um, enlighten me on this. Thank you. Okay, the first question, um, remind me, Ben, I, it was about, um, oh, the white cell count, right. Uh, you know, I've, I've heard so many vegans say that their white cell counts are a little bit lower. And, and, and in, in reality, it's really quite normal for our white cell counts to be a little bit lower. And I'm, I'm not, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a physician and I, I don't, I haven't done a lot of research on this particular topic, but my guess, just a sort of common sense guess would be that uh, we need a little bit fewer white cells when we have less to fight. <laughs> So um, it, it seems to make uh, sense. People do not seem to be adversely affected or have adverse health uh, uh, adverse health outcomes because of these slightly lower levels, slightly below. You know, you have to say, what are we basing normal on? And we're basing normal on omnivore. <laughs> And so vegans, the whole systems can be slightly different than that of an omnivore. And so I, I would say, uh, relax, don't worry about it. This is very, very common among vegans and very normal among vegans. And the second, the brown versus white adipose tissue, well, um, I, you know, again, it seems if you have higher levels of brown adipose tissue, you burn calories more efficiently. Effectively, it helps you with um, your metabolism. But again, I definitely not my area of expertise. And I think physical activity is, is uh, super important. Adequate rest is super important. But yes, there's definitely a difference between the metabolic uh, outcomes of people that tend to have higher levels of, of brown fat versus white fat. Mm -hmm.